Welcome to Art Now. I'm Philip Von Zweck of the Art and Art History and Design Department. If you are a student in the Art Now class, please check yourself in using the app. There is no pin this week, so you can just go ahead and do that. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to thank Professors Joan Giroux and Mel Potter for curating this series, uh, Gina Ordaz for handling so much of the admin work in making it happen, Matt for tech support and video support, um, Danielle and Gina, our sign language interpreters, and Jin Chow Lee, our graduate assistant. Ginny Ha is an artist and educator exploring the intentions of people's beliefs. Ha's recent ex exhibits include Canada Gallery, Socrates Sculpture Park, Bam Sin Fest, and the Smithsonian Archives of American Art. Ha's fellowship includes Smack Mellon, Baxter Street Camera Club of New York, Robert Blackburn, Print Shop SIP Fellowship, Queens Museum of Action Academy, American Academy in Rome as Visiting Artist, and Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Their book, published by Small Editions, is named in the best art books of 2021 by the Brooklyn Rail. Works are in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art Library, Yale University, Ohio State University, Emily Carr University of Art and Design, and the School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University. Ha holds a BFA from Brigham Young University and an MFA from Maryland College of Art, College of the Arts, and is Assistant Director of Education at the New Museum and Adjunct Professor at Parsons School of Art. Please help me welcome Jenny Ha. Okay, so um, my name is uh, G. Jenny Ha, and I'm really excited to be sharing my work with you all today. I'm starting off um, with kind of a collage of um, just artists and people that really inspire me. I think as an artist in the way that I think and also as an educator, there's many things that in inspire or influence the ways that I'm thinking about process and making art. And I just wanted to kind of showcase some of these really inspirational writers and thinkers and, and also educators and mentors that have really shaped a lot of the ways that I think about making and so, just wanted to note here my mom, who's like at the center here, who's who's a artist herself, and it was initially the main reason why I started in in art. She makes ceramic works, which is what she's standing in front of right here in the center. And surrounding her is many different artists and people and and writers. These are some of my favorite books. So, um, shout out to my teachers here, Marin Hassinger, Takai Booker, who are great mentors to me um, when I was in grad school, when I went to school at MICA. All right. I also included two pictures of nature because nature is a really big part of the ways that I think. It's also a really important aspect of just being for me to be in nature. Uh, and so I just included those images as well. Okay, so belief, um, as Philip introduced me before with the, kind of the ideas of, that I'm navigating my work, a lot of it is connected to belief and belief systems. I would like for you to take a moment to think about what do you believe and why? Uh, this is a question that I, I ask and I've been asking for many years uh, in my practice. If you can just take a moment for right now, this is like, you know, rhetorical just for yourself, but I would like to ask you to think about three things that you believe, whether that may be thoughts around family or about education, friendship, like uh, I already mentioned education, but maybe think about other things, maybe beliefs around money or whatever you want to think about. I just would like for you to just kind of take a moment to think about three things that you believe. So hoping that you have a couple in your mind. I'm interested to think about how did those belief systems get created? So with those three beliefs that you're thinking about, perhaps think about where does those ideas come from? Where do they stem from? So I'm really interested in that lineage of tracing those thoughts about where those belief systems get created. And what happens when your beliefs changes? And how do you re recreate these new belief structures? So those are the, some of the themes and kind of the concepts that I've been navigating through my work consciously and subconsciously. And I, I'm very interested in this idea of also like when do you know something? How, when do you, the idea of knowing? 
and the difference between belief and knowing. And so um, as I talk about my work, some of these themes will, will be kind of showing up as I discuss. Okay, so this is an image of my studio on the left. Um, it has a collage of different photographs that are from my family's archive. My grandfather was a photographer during the time when there was a Korean War. And so there's a lot of photographs that we have in our family. Um, and I really, for years, have been going through those photographs and trying to figure out, I mean, they're really beautifully photographed and they have such interesting stories. I love the stories that they're telling. They're images of them playing, eating, this picture of a dog or a picture of a garden or at school. And I just really like this kind of everyday look into what life was like in 1960s um, in Korea. And so uh, these are just photographs that I pulled together. The compositions are really wonderful. And I've been just having them as kind of like in my space with me, in my, in my studio. And one part of the journey of looking through these photographs, I was surprised, you know, so there's all these images, I'm going through all of them. And at one point, I noticed the only time I, I saw somebody who was not in Korean w was these missionaries. These are missionaries baptizing my fa father in this photo on the right, on the right, yeah. And uh, so that was a moment where, you know, it, it just kind of caught me by surprise and it's really interesting and it, and it kind of tells a story that I've been navigating a lot through my work in this idea of belief. So I'll continue here. Well, I'll go back here. So as I mentioned, this is my uh, father being baptized by the Mormon missionaries. And my grandfather was the first Mormon to be baptized by Mormon missionaries in Incheon, Korea, which is the third largest city in Korea. And so a lot of my stories and narrative come from there. And I'm interested in tracing that origin of the stories, and which is why I'm also interested in this idea of belief. So through my work, I'm navigating these questions in many different ways and many different disciplines and mediums. One of them uh, was a book that I made called All I Wanted Was to Get Into Heaven. And this book um, is made in edition of 12, by, um, printed and published by Small Editions. It is a book that uh, has a rechargeable music play box, which is at the top. You can see there's a little play button. And in the book, there is different texts and images that talk about this concept of um, Mormonism and my own personal journey leaving Mormonism. And so I'll show you a couple details of the book. It's just the beginning entrance, uh, entry point of the book. Uh, as I mentioned, the title is All I Wanted Was to Get Into Heaven. I'm realizing the text is really small here, so I'm going to see if I can bring it closer to me. Okay. I, I was told if I was really good, followed all the rules, did everything they told me to do, there was happiness on the other side, eternal happiness. So I followed all the rules, exactly as a good girl should. I didn't look at that, I didn't eat that, I didn't touch that, I didn't hear that, I didn't wear that, I didn't drink that, I didn't make that, I didn't buy that, I didn't read that, I didn't trust that, I didn't, I didn't, I promise I didn't. I was a very good girl, but may I? Shh, but what if? Okay. So that's the beginning part of the book. Um, the book continues to have more questions, which I think you know really is rooted in the, the idea at the entry point of the book is thinking about the concept of wanting to go to heaven, right? The, the desires to be good. And then also the point when you start to question things, which is why I think um, the concept of questioning is really important in the process of making and of just also being. These are some images that are in the book left side is an image of a, a baptism in the Mormon temple, collage onto this uh, paper that's mimicking water. And then on the right side is a very small image of the angel Moroni, which is on top of the Mormon temples. 
And that's the cover of the book. And the book entails 132 pages. Uh, yeah. And in addition to the book, uh, I created a, a zine, like a, a risograph of uh, the content of the writing in the book so that it's more accessible. Like I mentioned, we only made an edition of 12 for the other book. And so this is a zine that we created so that people could read and, and purchase um, and so, so that they have an op opportunity to read them. Also published by Small Editions. Okay, so, and also I'm talking about these books that I made in 2020. So just wanted to note that that book that I've been working on was, I was working on it for probably three, four years on my own and later got introduced and I mean, actually, Small Editions was like the dream place that I wanted to publish this book. And, but a lot of it in the beginning, I was working on it for three or four years. It took me many years to like get to that point to publish or also get your thoughts, get my thoughts in order to think about how I wanted this book to look like. And so that was many, many years in the making. Okay, so this next slide is some drawings that I made for the Socrates Sculpture Park exhibition called Sanctuary. I wanted to show these drawings because I think as artists we're I think behind the scenes is always kind of important and, and process is important to think about and talk about. The theme for the show is called Sanctuary and so it was very perfectly aligned to the ways that I was thinking about my work already and at that point so I've written this book where I published talking about my exodus of leaving Mormonism. And then now I was rethinking what does it mean to believe and how do you recreate spaces where you feel good and what, how do you rebuild these structures of belief systems again for yourself and what is sanctuary like f for people and when, especially when you've gone through an experience where you've had to re re rebuild everything. So, I was really thinking a lot about the space and the community. The so Socrates Sculpture Park is a really great organization, and it's located in Queens, New York, and um, this is my first public sculpture that I've made. It, and so, this, so f as far as the piece goes, I was really thinking about nature. I was really thinking about different access points for folks to interact and engage with the work. If I'm thinking about the journey of the concept of a, like a, maybe a, perhaps a spiritual journey or sanctuary space that looks very nonlinear and is there's a lot of different points of access and so I was thinking about that when designing and creating the space so as you can see I'm just like thinking of different spaces also opportunities for people to engage differently a ramp staircase different access points and so these were some drawings that I wanted to have I wanted people to be able to rest for people to be able to lay down and some of the questions that I was navigating while I was coming up with the piece so the piece oh and this is an image of the piece being installed so this was also a, a really wonderful and great experience I learned how to build a lot of things. Um, like I mentioned, this is my first public art and I was on site building and as the fun last part, I mean, it wasn't the last thing we had to do, but as part of the install is we had to get this crane to lift up the roof to install and set it in place, which, is a, which was a very exciting and nerve wracking day because you have to make sure the math is all correct. So there's a lot of math in sculpture, which, you know, I actually love math, so it's okay. But I, I learned a lot. There's a lot of those A squared plus B squared equals C squared happening here to build all of this, but it was really a, such a great, great experience. So this is a, render, a digital rendering of the piece, which, you know, I feel like it's not, there's no pressure to ever make things that looked exactly like your drawings or renderings, but sometimes when you get it, right? It feels so good. So, <laughs> so which is why I included it because I'm like, oh my gosh, it actually looks like the rendering. So anyway, so this is the piece at Socrates Sculpture Park. It was a group exhibition uh, called Sanctuary with incredible artists. It was such a great experience. 
And so this piece was up for six months. So there was a lot of things I had to learn to think about building a piece that would withstand weather, right? The, and this area right here, because right by the water, was probably the most windiest area. And also, yeah, thinking about materials and also where and pe people interacting with it. I really, what I really liked was that on the opening day, I think the kids just like knew what to do. They just like went on it and it just felt so natural and that felt really good to see because I felt like if the kids know how to interact with it, then that's like, you don't have to explain anything. It's just they just know how to work with the piece, which was like a really cool experience to have. I'm going to go through the details of like this is the decisions around why I made this piece in certain ways. As I mentioned, I was really interested in creating different points of access for people to look and peer through. I was thinking about portals. I was thinking about you know, sanctuary as a space for reflection and thinking, but different points of access. And so this ramp leads up to this kind of like window hole uh, of these trees, which were pictures, which was a picture of in Vermont where Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, was born. And then on the top corner, you have a picture of my grandfather, my grandmother, my dad, and my uncle here, and my aunt, I believe, is in the background somewhere too, feeding the Mormon missionaries. Um, this was used for a film. This was a still from a film that I used, which I'll sh show you some images of later as well. In addition, so these clouds that you're seeing were from that book that I made. So all of these things are kind of like folding into each other, which is kind of a cool thing to see how like things overlap. So another image of the viewpoint inside the space. Uh, the piece was, it says 40 foot long, eight feet wide, and 14 feet tall. And then the title, this like kind of like collage here, is to show, because it's a kind of a smaller image on the left, is all I wanted was to get to heaven was the other side, which is obviously from the book. Yeah. And then this is the viewpoint of the piece looking up. And in that uh, top part, there's a circular uh, hole that um, we made as like another point of like gazing up to the sky and yeah, looking up into towards heaven. There's another viewpoint of the piece. So one point about this, this, this is, so this is like a lunar pattern that I put together and this is based after some shamanic rituals dance patterns, so I was looking at those dance patterns and kind of mimicking those shapes when I was creating the pattern for the, for the, for the, underneath this arch. So I mentioned, so on, while I'm making these books and the sculpture, well this was made before the sculpture was made, but uh, like I mentioned, I really like to explore different mediums. I feel like Experimenting with different mediums allows you to access different things that you maybe wouldn't consider if you're working in just one way. So this was also my first time making a stop motion uh, Super 8 film. And this story is talking about, so in the Mormon church they have these conferences where they, it's like all day, not all days, but it's like several hours in the day where there are many speakers and they have a magazine they publish where they have these like excerpts about like what the like the main takeaways were from these talks. And so a lot of these languages pulled from these these lectures or these this conference talks. And the imagery behind it, I'm using a fisheye lens and it has this hand gesture. So this hand gesture is the gesture that Mormons give when they give consent to a leader or we, they call it sustaining a, uh, a leader. And so this is the gesture that you see all the time, the raising of the right hand. So there's images of that and some drawings and some photographs that I play around with that is timed in a very short video, one minute and 40 seconds. But it's really, yeah, it, it's a stop motion and, and I had a really great time making it. And a made in collaboration with support. And so the music composition, and the coloring and, and like the cinematography was done by Saif al Sabahi. And so this says a 96 year old man attends church. And then this is another image, once again, with the hand gesture. 
and it says the church and its members in Korea. Okay, so gonna so that was all. Well, the so the Socrates piece was like last year, so I'm kind of timelines are kind of warping. But I I wanted to show this piece because I think once again I think the idea that I work in many mediums and the uh, different mediums offer different ways of processing thought and. One of the things that happened while during the pandemic was I started painting again, which I hadn't done since I was like eight years old. And it was just something that I did for myself. It was really fun. It was another way for me to just like enjoy during a, a really, you know, and it continues to be a very difficult time. And this piece uh, is probably one of my favorite pieces because it, in a way, just talks a lot about the ways that I'm thinking about this idea of of portals, of different access points, of landscape, and different dimensions. And so, yeah, there's, and I think painting has always been a little bit part of my work, but I think there's ways that I'm thinking about this that inspires me in other ways in my practice. So I just wanted to share this with you all. In addition to that, I've been really interested in these Korean Minha paintings, which are older traditional landscape paintings and it's paintings of the people. So it's kind of like everyday paintings. I'm really interested, and you know, so this is a connection that my friend made for me, which is a lot of these work, a lot of the images that I'm doing with landscape and my paintings and also in my sculptures are flattening of these landscapes, which I think are also subconsciously inspired by these paintings. If you notice, they're very flat. Yeah, so I just want to share that with you because I think there's things that are happening to your work or maybe the things you don't consider. Maybe your friends see them or teachers or other people notice these things about your work and patterns that are maybe that you may not notice. But I think through, I just really love looking at these paintings. I think they're beautiful. I love the texture. I love kind of the, I mean, they're talking about these myths and it's, it's folk art too. It's just really interesting, this concept of these myth stories and and the colors that they're using, it's all very connected to the ways that I'm thinking about in my work. Okay, so as I'm continuing in my work, and this is kind of like a newer space that I'm navigating currently, is I'm thinking about platforms for observing celestial bodies. I've been like reading up and, and studying some Korean astronomy. It's really connected to this idea of heaven and like what is heaven and people's desires to learn something about the stars or to understand another world. And so I'm very interested in, in that idea and the platforms that people create to observe these spaces are very, and the architecturally are really interesting for me. So I've been looking at a lot of things and reading a lot about Korean astronomy. And so I'm gonna share with you some pieces that I've been making um, and then I have an upcoming show that I'm going to talk about, but the, the show is opening at the end of this month. And this is a little bit of information. So this is a piece initially I had made for this other proposal, but rethinking about these platforms and thinking about these other shapes of like temples or these other platforms. And so I created this piece. I, this is another example where I'm like, oh, I just this, did this drawing and I like sketched it out and I was like, oh, it like turns out kind of like the piece. So that's always a fun thing to see. So the, um, behind the scenes, BTS is a lot of math. Like I said, there's a lot of things to figure out when you're building something like, like how do this, these things work? Lots of math solving. And then on the left, this image is another drawing of the piece just in my studio along with the wood, I like, I like, I mean, generally I do end up recycling a lot of the wood, a lot of the materials. And so this is the piece in the exhibition at Canada Gallery that was open this past summer. It was a group exhibition, uh, Summer Nights, curated by Khalil Robert Irving. And so the, I, as you can see from the details, like the piece is on the left, on, on my left, yeah, left here too. And then at the bottom is Carly Mandel and Christine Woods. So other images of this piece. 
And for this piece, I was really interested in this mirror reflection that, that's found here. So I'm continuing on my journey to like kind of think about these platforms and shapes, and so I'm I'm like continuing on this like series of celestial bodies, and so this is another piece that I've been recently been making and working on, um, celestial bodies two. This hand gesture is the Boy Scouts honor, which is connected to Mormonism. The young men's program they are connected to the affiliated with the Boy Scouts, and this is the like a like a honor signal that's used. So I'm really interested in those hand gestures. And once again, this is the similar green image of Vermont that's used here as well. So forthcoming to be released is this new book called Calling Purim, which is going to be in conjunction in a adjacent to my show that is opening up at Baxter Street later this month for my solo exhibition. It's a piece, the book is a kind of a tie-in to the solo show, but also will be released at Printed Matter. It's also published by Small Editions. So we're like in, this is like a very exciting, I just got this like photo today. So <laughs> they're like literally in the process of like doing it all right now, which is really exciting. And, and I got to see the book, which is really wonderful. Shout out to Hannah and Isabel who really, they took my idea and they made it like a hundred times better, which is like so amazing when you have really talented people that really support you in your work. So I'm gonna read you a couple of past, like excerpts from the book. I haven't really read this out loud, so this is kind of the first time, which is kind of very cool. So they're just, there's certain pages that I've taken out, so it's not really, it is a little bit in chronological order, but it's not, continuous. I just pulled out kind of the main key points. I'll read it and then maybe I'll talk more about the concepts behind it. Haraboji grandpa met the Mormon missionaries at the Mogyoktang Korean bathhouse in the 1960s. He wanted to practice his English. Haraboji grandpa became the first Mormon in Incheon, Korea. When I first moved back to America, I was six. I was asked, I asked, I asked my Korean friend to help me translate what my teacher was saying. My teacher yelled at me for talking. My report card says, Ginny is Korean and does not speak English. Therefore, it is very hard to get her to do any work. My dad moved to Hawaii to leave, to leave political unrest, student protests. He went to BYU and learned English. BYU is Brigham Young University. It's a Mormon school. Three years in the army, one year as a Mormon missionary, one year learning English. A phone call home to Korea cost so much money, by the time my mom and grandma stopped crying, their phone time was up. My mom texts me, I would like to hear the, my daughter's voice. In Mormonism, you receive a calling. A calling is when you're asked to serve. Service can lead to heaven. Everybody is watching. This is an image from my grandfather's collection. What is in a line? Is it protection? Is it a barrier? Where is the line? What are the agreements to a line? Why do we form a line? Who created the line? And what happens when I cross the line? I was told I was out of line. I wanted to blur the lines. Another image from the archive. In the book, it's foil stamped, these orange parts, which is like a really cool thing. When I visited the DMZ, what I saw th that separated the north and south was a line, a concrete line. At the DMZ, there is a Seoul Pyongyang hotline, AKA inter-Korean hotline. 40 telephone lines connecting north and south Korea. Five of the lines for communication, 21 for negotiation, two for handling air traffic, two for sea transport, three for economic cooperation. Total, 33 telecommunication lines. Hotlines disconnected by North Korea, 1976, 1980, 1996, 2008, 2010, 2013, 2016, total seven times. So in that, I'm, I'm, oops, sorry, I'm advancing too fast. So this is just parts of the book. There's different facets of the book that are connecting, talking about 
uh, lines. They're talking about, um, as a, the title of the book is Calling, and then also this like concept of heaven and stargazing. So there's there are all these kind of through lines that we're t I'm talking about. I'm I think at this point right now I'm really kind of interested in the poetics of a line and what that can evoke, f and so I'm exploring those ideas in my work right now. And as I mentioned, the continuous uh, concept of like the platforms for of celestial observations is another point that I'm really interested in. And so as part of my research and part of my my readings, I came across this map of the Gyeongbok Palace in which sh uh, t talks about the different armillaries that are located in this palace. So they are no longer existing, but I just really love this drawing of this piece right here, as you can see. And so for my show at Baxter Street, I am recreating a version of this for my piece, which you won't get to see it all because it will be released later, but I'm showing you the drawing of how I'm imagining the piece, uh, and inside will be a video at the, in the center here. So this is like a sneak peek of like what's gonna be in the show, a little teaser. This is the structure kind of that I showed you in the drawing here on the right. This is another piece I'm working on that incorporates some photographs. The other part of the show that I'm talking a lot about in conjunction to my grandfather on my dad's side who was a photographer and, the, and who converted to Mormonism, my grandfather on my mom's side was a Marine during the Korean War and he um, lost all his family and had to restart his life after he fought in the war. And so a lot of the things that I talk about also in that book is related to my grandfather on the other side. And then also this is a map. I mean, this is a, a, a picture of his wall. He, he passed away in 2020, oh, I'm sorry, 2020 or 2021 during, during COVID. Yeah, it was 2020. Uh, and so this is the photograph that I took of his wall space, which has a map of Korea, and this is just like a half of the image, which is part of the book and also part of the installation at the show. So, and the last, this is the last slide, which is also part of the book and part of the conversation, is a photograph that I took of uh, tracings of water that my mom drew in the basement. I just really love this image. I just love that she's trying to show water and it's masked in this way and it's drawn in this way. And I took this photo many years ago and I was like, oh, this is like, this is art, you know, and I, I'm gonna use it for something in the future, but it really ties into this concept that I've been thinking about, this concept of like celestial observation, this idea of belief, it's pretty much observing the unobservable and navigating all of these concepts. And so also water being such a big theme in my work uh, previously. And and so, yeah, so this is uh, this is where I'm going to end my talk. And I'm really yeah, want to thank you for your time and open for any questions you may have. Thank you.